Rambling's the show that encourages you to get out and do your own ramblings. Get out there and explore the many things to do, places to go, events to attend, many of them right in your backyard. I'm in a very special backyard this week. I'm in New Bern, North Carolina. Now, unless you're from this area or you're a real historian, you probably don't know anything about New Bern, uh, North Carolina. And that's what we're here to do. We're at the Tryon Palace. Yes, indeed. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm with Leslie Lambrecht, yeah. uh, the historical costumer here <laughs> because they do costumes and in-person uh, uh, interpretation. And uh, uh, and I'm sure that was the wrong word, but that's okay. No, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, Leslie. Well, thank you so much, Rocky. Thanks for being on the show, and thank you for allowing me to be here at this wonderful place. It is a wonderful site, isn't it? Really it really is. It really is. Now. This show uh, it encourages people to get out and do some exploring. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is give them an idea in this first section of what their visitor experience is going to be like here. Oh, we have all sorts of things going on at the palace. Um, one of my favorite things to do here is go to our Pepsi Family Center. We take you in a time machine all the way back to the early 1800s. And uh, went in there yesterday to uh, sort of scope things out, and it's really cool. One of the, one of the toughest things of, of running these historical uh, places is getting people to to recognize the time area or, or the time zone that they're going to be going back to, uh, and and this is early 1800s, late 1700s. Yeah. It's a very active um, and interactive space yeah. here at the History Center. Um, we do have our regional uh, museum as well, which has a lot of very interesting things, and then of course we have the Jewel in the Crown, which is the palace. The palace itself. Yes, indeed. Uh, now there's an orientation film as well. There is. There is a short I think it's like a seven minute orientation film gives you the history of the palace okay. um, whenever I go to uh, an historic site or any place around because I, I love to ramble myself sure. um, that is always the first thing that I like to do and it just kind of puts you in the mindset yeah. of where you are it's always good to talk to yes. a fellow rambler. <laughs> yes. uh, you ramblers are a unique bunch. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> so the orientation film, and that is very important if you're going to go to a site, kind of get a feel for it before you launch in yeah. so that you Yeah. So, so you understand things. where you are and what the place in, in history sure. um, that you're you're representing and looking at. Sure. So. And then, of course, you buy a ticket and you go right. over to the palace and you're met at the front door of the palace. Ah, uh, yes, by a costumed interpreter. Yes, but, and that's where yes. she's <laughs> Leslie makes those costumes. Um, and, uh, but our, we have costumed interpreters throughout the palace and in the kitchen. And we'll get to the kitchen in a minute because sure. the kitchen is a fascinating thing. Oh, yeah, fascinating um, but as you tour the governor's palace, they will talk to you. Um, we, we do third person interpretation here, which means they are not a specific character. Okay. They are talking about the, the time that they are in and the place in which they are. Right. Um, so they go through, and I one of my favorite spots, of course, um, is up in Mrs. Uh, Martin's bedroom, sure. and the, all of there are a lot of clothes laid out, and so well, of um, course, and of course, yeah. and and they will actually tell you all the different layers that people had to wear because it wasn't simply oh, I'm going to put on a shirt and shorts today and go out rambling. No, oh yeah, dressing took a good half an hour. Yeah. It's really fascinating to to realize that there are people lives all up until our time had so many different obstacles to oh, yeah. deal with and yeah. it wasn't just you know rolling out of bed and going and making money there was a lot of stuff that had to happen before you could actually go out to your your wig shop or sure. your you know whatever I love I love getting into the history of things, but one of the things right. that you also get out of studying history is a real appreciation for the technologies that we have today. Oh yes. that makes life a lot easier. Oh, and one of my favorite questions that all of our interpreters get is, "Aren't you hot in that?" Well, yes, it's 90 degrees. It's Newburgh. I'm hot in this. Sure. You're hot in what you're wearing. With the yeah. natural fibers that they were right. wearing, because none of them had man-made fibers. Yes. When when you get a breeze going through the sweat stove clothes, it oh, actually yeah, cools you off. Absolutely. It's really a nice little yeah. little 
system that was going oh, yeah. on. We could talk all day about <laughs> yes, that, we but we better move on. All right, so, so you do the entire palette. You do the entire with, palette. With the and, and Yeah, and you, you learn about, you know, how the governor used the palace <clears throat> because it was a state house as well as a residence. Um, they talk a uh, little bit as they take you out of the cellar about the storage of goods and things. And then you head off to the kitchen. And the, the kitchen. kitchen is one of my favorite spots yeah. on site yeah. because they are cooking and with 18th century methods, 18th century recipes, and they are doing it all in right costume, there. right there in costume. And uh, so it's very interesting to see what they make and sure. what the food was like at that time because mm -hmm. it's a whole different menu than what we would ever consider. No can of soup to no, open. No pork. can of soup, mm -hmm. but I mean, when they were using beef, they used the whole cow. Oh, yeah. And, and everything got yeah. used in some yeah. way, shape, or form. Yeah. And so we try to try to talk a lot about that in the kitchen. Um, the kitchen office is also used as, uh, it was the laundry, it was the um, ironing room, it was all sorts Everything. of things. The servants lived mostly over in the kitchen area. Um, so you'll see a lot of that as well in the kitchen. Um, but you will be able to talk to the cook who's cooking. Um, and then where do we eat the food? Uh, well, <laughs> depending on the recipe, um, we, we often don't, uh, you know, really allow the, no, the public to taste kidding. that um, because you are dealing with an open fire cooking method. So if you're doing chicken or eggs or something like that, you can't always be sure that you're meeting FDA standards. No, no, no of course. Um, but it is, it's really interesting to see what goes oh, yeah. on in there. And then uh, briefly, you, you do the palace, you do the mm -hmm. kitchen, and then you've got the other building, the Stanley yes, House. Yes, and do. We do have uh, the Stanley House, John Wright Stanley House, and we also have the Dixon House. And both of those have their own docents, so mm -hmm. you'll go, you'll actually go to that section of the ground exactly and check in and check in and um, we, we have a secondary ticket office there where we meet everybody and you'll go to the Stanley house and walk through theirs and um, that's a little forward in time in the early 1800s sure. and then the Dixons are usually in the 1830s um, and they talk about Mr. Dixon was a tailor and so they talk a little bit about um, his life and things and um, like some people, he kind of lived above his means, and so um, kind of got in trouble financially, but he had a really nice house in the meantime. Yeah. Um, and of course, the other thing that we that we that we must talk about before we go to our break is it, it, when you come down here, you've got to check out the gardens. They have some. Oh, of those we have some gardens. amazing gardens. We have a so. wonderful garden staff um, that works tirelessly on their gardens, and um, it's not just the gardens behind the palace, which are beautiful. And there's a lot of wilderness gardens to wander through. Yep. Um, there's, our, of course, the French Partier gardens and other things. Um, very very well set up, but the Stanley House has gardens behind it. Yes. Um, the uh, Stanley Gardens actually run into uh, the Caraway Gardens, which are nearby, and then that runs into a different set of gardens, and it's just really nice to be able to wander these paths, yeah. and just each garden has its own feel, its own structure, That's right. and it's just really nice to, to take a look yeah. at, at all of and that. And the Kitchen Garden? The Kitchen Garden is where we grow the fruits yeah. and vegetables and that we use in the kitchen, and the herbs and, and medicines, and, because we do yeah. grow medicine in there. Is that right? Yeah. And, and, and the gardens are old, old world. So mm -hmm. you get a chance to see uh, the fruit trees. Yeah. They actually spray yeah. them up against the wall and, and force them to grow that way. What do they call that? Expiliorated. Expiliorated <laughs> fruit trees. Yeah. Yes, indeed. That's that's one of those words you just, once you get it down, you're like, I'd love to say that. Gotta word. say that. Word, <laughs> anyway, so the gardens are great. The, the, oh, yeah. the extra buildings are wonderful. You really get a chance to see what life is like uh, or was like in the late 1770s, early 1800s. Mm -hmm. I hate to do this, but we've got to go to a break. Okay. <laughs> and when we come back, we will be talking about the historical significance of this site. A little more in depth. Of course, we've done a little bit of that, but we'll be right back.
Here in the museum store, you'll find all kinds of gifts and souvenirs, lots of books, um, specifically history books about the area, Craven County, the city of New Bern, and of course, books about the Tryon Palace itself and the history of how that was the first capital of North Carolina. Um, this book was written specifically about the Tryon Palace. They also have fine table glassware as you can see candle holders vases uh, china beautiful china available uh, so it's not just souvenirs it's also fine art um, handmade pottery beautiful handmade pottery available um, in the store and uh, wonderful thing as you're thinking about souvenirs don't forget the kids uh, they need to have things that will help them to remember uh, their trip to the Tryon Palace here we have historically oriented gifts uh, that will give them something to play with and remember for a long time so make sure that you check out the museum store while you're at the Tryon Palace. Welcome back. I'm with Lindy Cummings. She is the historian. She's the one that knows all the really important stuff around here. We're glad to have you on the show. Thank you. And uh, what a great place. Uh, New Bern, North Carolina. Yes. The Tryon Palace is an incredible place historically, and let's just start there. Why is it such an incredible place from a historical perspective? Well, there's really two phases to that. So there's the initial period in the 18th century, and then there's the 20th century story. So the reason why this is a significant location in the 18th century is that it's one of the few cities that's located on a navigable river, which is really key in the 18th century because yeah. water is your highway. And right. it's on the coast, which is key because that's uh, where trade is being facilitated. Um, and it's not Wilmington. And that, I will explain that in just a moment. <laughs> it is not so Wilmington. That, that's a key factor. Um, so in the 1760s, William Tryon arrived here. He had had a career as a military officer. He was appointed governor by the king. Um, now, he was royal he was british he was british okay. well everyone considered themselves british even yeah, well that's true here, they are british citizens that's true um, they're living on the margins of empire and sometimes they feel forgotten but right. they are also citizens okay. but he comes and he's going to take over for arthur dobbs who was a, a long-standing governor dobbs um, decides that he's maybe not gonna he's gonna stay in just a little bit longer which makes trying a little bit upset but th at that time um, there is no permanent seat of government it is sort of bouncing around. It might be in New Bern, it might be in Wilmington, but primarily it's in Brunswick where Dobbs has his own private home okay. in, in Brunswick town, which is not uh, no longer standing. It's a historic site, but it, it was burned by the British during the revolution. Uh, Tryon moves um, to create some kind of a permanent uh, capital space. He wants an official government house that is befitting the magnificence of the king and oh, cool. you know try and as the representative of the king in the colonies and other colonies have nice homes too for their governors right. such as colonial williamsburg which probably everyone is more familiar with than perhaps Tryon's palace uh, but he initially is um, centered in brunswick goes to wilmington uh, Wilmington and he have a dispute during the Stamp Act crisis <laughs> and he basically washes his hands of Wilmington and despite them moves the capital to New Bern. To New Bern. So yes. this is not Wilmington this by design. This is not design. Wilmington. No. So they moved to New Bern yes. and they built the Tryon Palace. Yes. So and it is truly befitting of a royal um, uh, governor. Yes, it is. And it was, it, it, his title for it was the Government House. Oh, and okay. it was called the palace more or less kind of because it was such a grand building and because it cost so much money and people were not happy with that because it uh, oh, they, they had to levy a tax so the word palace was almost a bad word yes it, it was both people were amazed because it was a huge and beautiful building yeah. uh, done in the latest architectural style but it was also very expensive and people felt that you know, it was an undue burden. There's that they had better ways to use these, these heavy exactly, taxes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So. All right. Yes. So then, uh, so they went about uh, running it as a as a British colony. Right. And then, of course, these uppity Americans decided to fight for their independence. Right. And now New Bern is 
um, a capital without a country and becomes then... New Britain is vulnerable during the war okay. because the British, of course, are the largest navy in the Atlantic world and it's very easy to sail up the river. So very early on, they move the center of governance away uh, to Hillsborough and elsewhere, Halifax, to keep away from the dangers that New Britain oh, poses. Okay. So the palace is more or less empty. They uh, do have the inaugurations of the um, new governors once they are uh, the United States and part of the United States. But no one really lives in the palace permanently after the, the revolution. Okay, so, and, so let me get this straight. Yes. The, the capital uh, was in New Bern for only a very short time. Right. And it moved from here then to Hillsborough? They're just kind of, it's like it's, many other colonies. It, the government is wherever you can flee outside the British okay. control. All right. And so they are at Hillsborough, they're at Halifax. And you know, more or less, New Britain is, as it has been, kind of supposed to be the center, but it doesn't end up being that but way. It doesn't. It's not functional exactly, that way. Exactly. Okay. It's Understand. too dangerous. Okay. And then in 1794, <laughs> they decided to move the capital elsewhere, and they pick Raleigh. And yeah. so then officially right. the capital is elsewhere. And then the palace is more or less abandoned. It's used for a variety of purposes. Um, but it is, uh, in 1792, it's noted that it's rapidly hastening to decay. So it's not really? looking its best any longer. And then in 1798, it burns under mysterious circumstances. Yeah, to the ground. it burned to the ground, yes. brick building burned to the ground. Yes. And uh, uh, now one of the most interesting parts of the story of the Trione Palace is that they built an interstate highway over top of it. Yes. And then, it's a how, did that, how did that happen? The interstate highway? Yeah. Well, it's it's, just, it's unclaimed space. Okay. And so a neighborhood gradually, the, the lots are divided up and people build homes on them and it's gradually subsumed into the neighborhood. And George Street is extended forward all the way down to the river and it's just part of the evolution of the, of the city over time. And it's not until the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s, they start to think about um, palace as it was and wouldn't it be lovely to rebuild it and of course colonial williamsburg is being rebuilt at this time and that's sure. inspiring a lot of imagination absolutely and so i think that a lot of the ideas a lot of the inspiration for the reconstruction of the palace comes from what they're doing at williamsburg under yeah. the rockefellers so they actually moved the interstate highway so yes. that they could reestablish the Tryon palace yes that's a political story that needs to be told, but we don't really have time in a half an hour show to get really into that, but it's a very interesting part of the story. It was very contentious. I'm sure it was. <laughs> I've worked with DOTs and Federal Highway Administration. There's a lot of power in there. Yes. So somebody with some real power got involved in that, but uh, but we'll save that for another conversation. Um, but but when they when they actually started working the site, they started to dig out, and they actually found the the original foundations. They did. They located the original foundations, some of the foundation walls, and they used what they could, what was stable. Some of it was not able to be used, and so they removed that sure. and filled it in with and new brick. Sure. So. But the, but the actual bricks were still there, all piled into the old foundation. All sorts of architectural evidence, um, bits of Amazing. marble, uh, bits of flooring, and they were able to save a lot of that to kind of yeah. analyze for how they wanted to then reconstruct the palace and match material with material as yeah. best they could. So, so the cool thing that you're going to see when you come down to this area is the building as it was before it was burned to the ground, before it was covered over with a highway, all that taken out and rebuilt to be the, the the palace that it was to begin with. That's a huge part of the story and a really cool thing to, to pay attention to as you're touring through the site. Let's talk about uh, the gardens were a huge right. part of European royalty. Absolutely. And that was uh, brought to the Trion Palace. Yes, we don't know what they looked like that, although. Like, oh, okay, so these so, reconstructed. Yes, these are colonial revival gardens that we oh, have here. Okay. They're sort of mixing the two predominant styles that were in Europe, not necessarily here in the colonies in Europe in the 18th century you've got okay. very high French formal geometric um, style which you know very um, ordered right angles very regimented not so many flowers and then you've got English landscape style which is more the south lawn it's meant oh, to look okay. as wild and natural as possible even though it's been completely um, 
organized and carefully arranged by the gardener. But just beautiful. Just yes, beautiful. Yes. From a very European perspective, just yes. beautiful. So make sure that when you're rambling over to see the Trion Palace that you take time to see these beautiful, beautiful yes. gardens. It's a big part of the history of, um, uh, of royalty of mm -hmm. a European uh, way that was brought to this country. I hate to do this, Lindy. We could go on all day, but we do need to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk about special programs, special tours, uh, rotating uh, exhibits, and, and things that will have you coming back time after time. We'll be right back. for the final segment of today's show. Uh, I am now with Craig Ramey. He is the Director of Public Affairs for the Tryon Palace and the gentleman that helped me set this all up. So I really appreciate your help setting this whole thing up and welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to do it. Happy yeah. to have you here. Oh, good. Yeah, and uh, we, we just love this place. Uh, what I want to do now is I, I want to talk about uh, what goes beyond the basic visitor experience? What can you do here beyond just coming to visit? Mm -hmm. Well, we've always got to make sure that we're changing things up, right? We sure. want people to feel like they can come back again and again, and it's going to be a little bit different every time. Yeah. 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 So we've got lots of new programs that we're always trying to come up with. And, you know, those of us who have been here for a little while, and then those who are newer to the staff, we always get together and try to come up with new ideas. So it's a real organic, fun process to see uh, people from different backgrounds all get together and see what's worked for them. And, and so, you know, for me, one of the most fun things of working here is developing those programs for the next year because even as somebody who's been here for four years I would like to see things different every year so and, I'm not doing And you thing. don't even know it. So there's a real creative energy mm -hmm. in how things are developed so you never know what they're going to be developing next. Uh, we visited here, uh, uh, I don't know, three years ago and the amount of development that they have here in just those three years has really been incredible. So we're really enjoying seeing the newness of, of what's going on here. And that's a great thing. And that it sounds like that's going to continue on. Absolutely. All right. All right. So now if you're a school group or a, or a special group, can they contact you and, and set up something specific? Oh, yes. So school groups are one of the biggest sections of our visitor market here at the Palace. I'm you sure. Know, uh, in North Carolina, uh, North Carolina history is taught in the fourth grade, and, and students from all over Eastern North Carolina want to come here and get that specific experience. I'll, so I'll, I'll bet the fourth graders just love this. Place. They do. Well, you know, it's, it's common when I'll see somebody around, and the, I'll tell them that I work at Tryon Palace, I'll say, oh, I went there in the fourth grade. Yeah. It's like, I hear it all the time. Yep. Uh, but yes, we have specific tours that we okay. set aside just for students, uh, fourth graders, and, and other grades as well. But it allows them to have that curriculum understanding right. of North Carolina significance, uh, but also the hands-on experiences and where they can have fun and, and learn history in different sure. ways too. So we do that so that teachers can come here and it actually correlates with what they might be doing in the classroom. Yeah, that's a really neat thing about the way history is being taught in schools now as opposed to when we were young, back when history was still being made. <laughs> Because history was was just dry and boring, and mm -hmm. and, uh, and I always felt cheated mm -hmm. that we weren't uh, that we didn't learn some of the things, and, and having some place like the Tryon Palace available, it's a wonderful thing. But not just school groups, other groups as well. And, Absolutely. And, uh, and we'll put uh, on RockiesRamblings.com. You'll see down below the video. I'll have phone numbers and, and websites that will help you to uh, to find that that type of things. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then, uh, and then, of course, we have a picture of a wedding happening yes. in front of the palace, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, I would love to have a wedding in a place like the Tryon Palace. So you can actually rent the building. You sure can. Uh, we're. Fairly large site, so there are lots of different venues all around the site. So yeah. uh, it's very common for people to see Tryon Palace and and be inspired by uh, the setting and, and want to have a wedding here. So uh, we have weddings here all the time. Really, it, the most difficult part is with all the programs that we have. We can't have a wedding and a program going on at the same Fitting time. Fitting it all together. Right? Yeah, there's only so many Saturdays <laughs> sure. in a year. You know. That's right. But and I think it's a very beautiful setting. It's very oh, unique. It you can't get it anywhere Absolutely. else. We had one here 
Uh, well, I mean, we have one nearly every weekend that's open. Wow. Somebody will try to book one if we don't have some other event going yeah. on. Yeah. But yes, it's it's a historic setting. We, we you know part of our marketing for that is you know every bride deserves a palace or every fairy tale deserves a palace. And, there you go. And that's what we try to do for them. And and so we have garden settings which are very popular. And then of course the setting you see here is right in front of the palace. Sure. Uh, great opportunities for for wedding photos as well. Oh, so I can imagine that the wedding photos would just be incredible here. But now, and during the break, we were actually talking about that the corporations actually rent the palace mm -hmm. for them to have their uh, corporate uh, gatherings. That's right. Cool idea. So there's all kinds of opportunities to yeah. use the the, the, the Trial Palace. We actually have one corporation that has rented our facility for five years in a row. It's a global corporation. One of the largest in the in the world. Wow! And uh, they come here every year for their annual shareholders meetings. Well, here in the North Carolina History Center, this is really the more modern uh, location for corporate sure. rentals and, and weddings use it as well because of the catering kitchen and because of the waterfront settings that we have and we have a performance hall so people will actually have lectures we haven't we've had naturalization ceremonies here before uh, plays uh, and so we've got all these modern amenities and a beautiful setting so and, and then of course on the second floor of this building we've got the most beautiful boardroom I think in Eastern North Carolina. Wow! And and that's available. It is. It's available for rent. Wow! Mm -hmm. Okay. And it has you know drop down screens and whiteboards and uh, a, a second floor view of the Trent River. Wow! So, so it's a beautiful view. And you can have your conferences here. You can do whatever you want to do here. Wow! And we've actually had some some people have small conferences here or like a seminar in our okay. performance hall and then maybe a breakout session and and the boardroom upstairs. Yeah. All right. Well, I tell you what, this has been this has been a great visit. Again, I thank you for helping me set this whole thing up and welcoming uh, me to the sh to the area for the show. It's been it's been truly great. Um, thank you for uh, being on the show and telling us uh, what there is to do uh, beyond the, the the basic visitor experience. And so, um, obviously, we can't cover everything in half an hour stuff, yeah. on two dimensions so you're going to have to ramble over here to New Bern, North Carolina to see the Triumph Palace for yourself. There's also a lot of other things uh, in the community. This is a great place. We're going to come down and spend a week here at New Bern just seeing what else there is in town. It's a great place to visit, a great place to ramble. So I encourage you to do that and I also encourage you when you're out doing your rambling make sure that you're in a safe well-maintained vehicle and today's uh, uh, defensive driving tip is to make sure that your brakes are functioning properly. If they're if they're squeaking, pulling to one side, uh, chattering, anything that doesn't feel like good solid stopping, make sure that you have a good brake mechanic. Check it out before you head on the road. We want to make sure that you get there and back safely, and that's your defensive driving tip for the week. Until next episode, here's wishing you safe rambling. <laughs>